when my oldest was uh, approaching school age, we started to investigate schools for her to attend, and I was, I was taking a tour of a charter school, and I asked, what do you do to promote creativity? And the administrator quickly kind of responded to me and said, we think art is overrated. We think that you could better use that time for more academic purposes. Now, obviously, this person had no idea I teach animation and film at this university. But what gets me is the ignorance of the response, because I didn't say anything about art. I asked about creativity. And so I wonder if she, like many other people, only associate creativity with the arts. Animation exists where art and technology meet, and it, it's always been this way, drawing, digital painting, computers and film, um, narratives and algorithms, right? As the head of the animation program at BYU, I sit firmly at these crossroads. Back in December, we were able to host Russell Hicks, who's the head of cr the, the creative director for Nickelodeon Studios, and I told him this story, kind of facetiously making fun of this charter school, told him the story about the charter school visit I had made, and he said, don't people realize that everything we wear, everything we have and use, the cars we drive, the homes we live in, was first created by a designer? For those of you who don't know, a designer is an artist. He's trying to validate what we do. Um, anyway, in addition to that, I could talk at length about the value, just the pure value of art, from the Greeks to the Renaissance to the modernists, music, dance, theater, architecture, the use of uh, art and religion, the use of illustration and photography and marketing, the impact of television and film, and yes, even the use of art in video games. So much so, uh, art has an impact so much so that currently the number one export of the United States is entertainment product. And I have to admit, not all, not all entertainment product is artistic, but I do think it aspires to be. Uh, arts are inherently creative, but do they have a, a lock on creativity? I don't think so. Creativity, to me, is simply problem solving. Uh, it's not in the aesthetics. It's in the ability of the individual or the group to solve problems, to innovate, to find new uses for tools and technology. Uh, I, I recently came across this story, which I thought was really interesting and, and plays very heavily into this idea. Um, at Texas Instruments, there was a, doc, a, a doctor, a scientist, named Larry Hornbeck. And in 1987, he developed DLP technology. Now, what's so fascinating about that is this technology innovated the way we project movies. Previous to this technology, movies were an analog system of film on print, and motion picture films were so large that they'd have to break down these prints into separate reels, multiple reels. They'd ship them out to the theater. The theater would have to reassemble the prints, put them on a large platter, and show them to the audiences. Now, the problem with analog prints is the more you project the image, the more the image degrades and scratches and looks bad. We all know if you've all been to a dollar movie, you know how bad the movie looks because it's been projected so many times by the time it gets to that theater, it's horrible. Well, this DLP technology completely revolutionized that. With this technology, the studios can simply send a digital file to the theater, and that file can be projected countless times with no degradation of image. The way DLP technology works and what's so fascinating about it, because it now dominates uh, three quarters of the cinematic projected world, the way it works is it's a digital microprocessor that has microscopically small mirrors all laid out in a matrix on a semiconductor, on a semiconductor pr uh, processor. As the light hits these microprocessors, um, well, first of all, we have to back up. These mirrors that are on this microchip 
on this microprocessor are so small that to be seen, you have to look at them through a, high power, a high-powered microscope. As light hits these mirrors, they turn to basically on and off positions. And as they bounce back, they create, each mirror creates one or more pixels on the screen. To get a color image, that light then has to travel through with the single processor machine, has to pass through a spinning color wheel. And that's how it picks up its color. With uh, multiple processor machines, the light is sent through a prism divided into red, green, and blue light, and then they sent to chips for each one of those specific colors. Now, I can't tell you if Horn, Dr. Hornbeck can draw or paint or if he plays an instrument, but he most certainly is creative because he's completely revolutionized the cinematic world. This year, we celebrate the 25th anniversary of the World Wide Web. Um, as an associate, as a fellow at CERN, uh, which is located on the Swiss-French border, for those of you who don't know, Tim Berners-Lee saw the ability to connect hypertext documents to the internet. And I know a lot of us think the World Wide Web is the internet, but it's not the same thing. What he was trying to do was effectively find a way to share documents inside the organization, find, update, share these documents. But by connecting hypertext, do hypertext documents and looking through a web browser, you could now share text, images, videos, and essentially he created the World Wide Web changing, revolutionizing the way we share and process information today. Now, I can't tell you here again if Berners-Lee has any art chops, but I can tell you that he's definitely creative and has changed the way in which we live. When I was asked to come to BYU to start the animation program, I knew we had several problems we were going to face. Uh, first of all, animation is inherently an artistic process, um, and BYU tends to accept students based on their academic prowess. And I'm not saying academics aren't artistic, but they are somewhat separate uh, skill sets and smarts, right? Additionally, BYU is a religious institution, and you have to take religion courses. These are things we really like here, but it takes you away from some of your other studies to the level that by the time you graduate from BYU, you're only a, a few classes shy of a minor in religion. As we thought about this, we looked at other art schools, and we recognized that most of them had only general ed lectures on Saturdays. And we knew our students were at a significant disadvantage for the amount of time they were going to have to spend studying and perfecting their skill sets. Uh, so what did we do? We approached a computer scientist. That computer scientist is Ed Catmull, the co-creator and president of Pixar Animation Studios. He's now also the president of Disney Animation Studios. We asked him what he would do, and luckily he's a Utah native, he was aware of BYU, he knew what our students had in terms of their aptitude, what, what they liked to do, what they could do, and he suggested that we take a measured approach. Instead of just focusing on art or like visualization programs, just focusing on computer science, he thought we should find some place in between. Uh, so we do what we call develop smart artists. These are artists who take art and animation courses and additionally learn how to program. Through programming, they can learn how to create procedural textures, create simple tools, build pipelines that can control the production process and, and, and control the assets involved in these animated films. Uh, by doing this, we also realized that we needed to take advantage of what time we did have. And so based on my experience in the industry, uh, we decided to do something that was a little different from art schools. We decided to emphasize the fact that animation is a team sport. So instead of making lots of little films, we kind of gang up and make large group projects. Through this, we've won 12 Student Television Academy Awards and four Student Academy Awards in the 10 years we've been competing with films. That's essentially one third of the Student Television Academy Awards that have been given in the time we've been competing. Um, thank you. We have graduates at all of the major animation studios and at all the, major animation, uh, all the major visual effects houses. In addition to that, we have students at countless video game companies. We have graduates working in Australia, New Zealand, China, England, and our films have played globally in student and professional film festivals. Uh, it's been a really, really rewarding experience, but what does that matter to you? What do you care? You're here to learn something. How can you empower people? What can you do to promote creativity? I would first suggest that we stop associating creativity just with the arts, that we see everyone as inherently creative. And by doing this, we can empower them. Through empowering people to be creative, 
they can find solutions to problems. And you can mix and match people inside your organizations that you wouldn't normally. You can put your tech people next to your artistic people. And by rubbing shoulders, it will expand their minds. They'll be able to work together to find answers to the questions you're looking for and subsequently give you great rewards in the process. Simply put, creative workers are empowered workers, and empowered workers find solutions to problems. The last time we visited Ed Catmull, we asked him, what do you think the world is going to do? What's going to happen with our industry? And he said, you know, I, I, I can't predict the future. So instead, I just make it. <laughs> yeah, that's easy for him to say, right? Uh, but there's something very powerful to that. And I just want to wish you the best as you move forward and you make the future. Thanks. <laughs>